Hello, everybody. Welcome. Today, we have some fantastic student readers who are going to be reading today. They are creative writing students from our 300 courses. And they're going to be sharing some of their, our, their work with us today. It's not easy creating during this time period. It's not easy turning imagination into words at any juncture. So I wanna congratulate any creative writing student who was doing the work of craft and creativity this semester. Congratulations to getting towards the end and doing that creative work. It takes the courage to do the work, but it also takes courage to express and to share work. So I wanna congratulate and thank all the students who are here today who are gonna put their imagination through the internet right at you so we all can all participate and enjoy it. And with that, I'll just jump right in. Our first reader is Jade Anderson. Hello, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, okay. I'm Jade Anderson. I'm a creative writing major and a filmmaking minor. And uh, so yeah, here's my, here's my thing. <laughs> it all seems so recent to me yet far away in the past. Freshman orientation, first day, pep rally, trying to figure out why homecoming king and queen are still a thing. Teenage angst, two-faced best friends, sweaty locker rooms, mental breakdowns, finding out that everyone was having sex, bitchy teachers, caring teachers, bitchy teachers that cared, the kid that smoked behind the gym, honor roll, guidance counselors pretending to care, sports teams almost getting all the school budget despite not winning any games. Midnight drives, most likely to take over the world. The girl drive, sorry, the girl crying in the bathroom at prom. The boy who can't dance being in the center of the dance circle. Caps and gowns, obligatory pictures with the mascot, diplomas, caps mid-flight, cursing the last four years, and goodbyes. And then it's over. High school ends almost as quickly as it begins. It's over and I have nothing to show for it besides my emotional distress. I was given an impossible task at age 40. Write a screenplay about a teenager. Well, what's the conflict, I asked. Up to you, the producer said. The limitless freedom the studio gave me was what, sorry, was what a lot of writers wished for. I, on the other hand, wanted to scream because of it. Teen movies were in, apparently. Everyone wants to be reminded of their snotty adolescent years for some reason that I will never understand. I put those years behind me as soon as I could. I was never popular. I wasn't even one of those theater kids with big dreams and little talent. I was a nothing. How am I supposed to write a story about a nothing? I asked that to, the, to Anna, the producer. Think back to when you were in high school, she said. I shuddered. That was a time, not one I go back to voluntarily. That was 25 years ago. Haven't things changed since then? They haven't changed that much. They still obsess over sex and drugs and music, right? Yeah, probably. I don't know. A lot of them seem to talk about the climate a lot and shootings. Well, don't write about either of those. We want the audience to feel nostalgic, not suicidal. Why do I have to write it anyway? Isn't there a better project for me? Well, I'll give you a better project after I sue you for breach of contract. Just write it. Hey, who knows? Maybe it'll be really good and the kids will love it. You could call yourself a teen whisperer then. I sat at my desk and waited for inspiration to strike. Inspiration didn't seem to care about me, so I just sat there for hours like a loser. Just the loser I am. I can't even write about being a teenage loser, loser because I wasn't. I was just a normal kid who knew high school is not the end of everything. Maybe I was wise for my age, or maybe I didn't know how good I had it until it was over. All right, thank you, Jade. That was great. What did you say? How, how am I supposed to write a story about a nothing? I, I, I hear that. Well done. Next, we have Christopher Carmody. Hello. Hi, I'm Chris Carmody. I'm an English major. Um, pardon me, I had uh, oral surgery this morning, so uh, I think I sound normal, but it, it's taken quite an effort to, to sound normal. <laughs> Um, so I wrote, this is from a, uh, a play that I'm writing and I wrote a little intro just because there's a lot of uh, context here. That, uh, so this is about a um, young man named Sam who lives in a small town, Vermont, where several months earlier, a meteorite fell into his backyard. And ever since then, the people of his town have gotten superpowers. Uh, also, Sam's boyfriend, Daniel, was accepted to an art school in New York City. And this conversation takes place the day before he's supposed to leave. Sam's mother is in a persistent vegetative state, and that is one of several reasons why Sam is now questioning his decision to leave. Also, he is dealing with the increased scrutiny by agents who may or may not work for the government. So, 
and this is Sam. Um, I wished my mom was dead and then all this happened. That's when the meteorite fell to earth. I mean, it's a meteorite before it hits the atmosphere and a meteor before that. The one thing that has, I'm sorry, <laughs> I messed that up. That's when the meteorite fell to earth. I mean, it's a meteoroid before it hits the atmosphere and a meteor before that. The one thing has three different names. It doesn't change what it is, but it still has three names. Wishing death on your mother has one name, evil. Can't slice it three ways. The day I agreed to move to New York with you, I wished my mother would die. I wished that she would die so I wouldn't have to stay here anymore. I've never thought that before. I always wished that she would get better. But after four years of nothing, four years of doctors not knowing what the hell's wrong with her, I stopped wishing she'd get better and I just wish she'd die. I wanna say and believe that I was making the wish for her just as much for me, you know, to set her free, to set us both free, but it was for me. I wanted her to die so I can live. It was that spot in her backyard where I take her to sit every night where we, where I talk to her. We have those whole three acres back there and right in the very spot where I take her every night, not an inch to the left or the right, but right on the spot where the grass was dying from us sitting there so often, that's where it hit. It was a little late though. Mom was already in bed. She didn't even wake up when the impact shook the whole house and set off every car alarm in town. Not long after that is when things started happening. First, the walking kids flying, then Mr. Brown has laser vision, then a third of the town is like something out of Justice League. And it was me. I made it happen. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I know it was me. It was because I wish my mom was dead, and now we live in this circus lodge of a town, and these men in black are after me, and mom is just still a shell of a woman. Why couldn't she gain the power to walk again, to talk, to tell me she loves me? But she wouldn't love me if she knew what I'd done. That was powerful, Chris. Thank you for, for reading and thank you for playing injured. Oral surgery on the same day. Not easy, but you did fantastically. Next, we have Jillian Carson. Hi, um, I'm a freshman creative writing major and I'm going to be reading two poems that I wrote for Professor Julie Sheehan's poetry workshop this semester. Uh, the first one is called Words I Wish You Had Never Awoken. I can hear them from across the chasmic kitchen vile words against the walls of your mouth, how hatred seems to secede from its host of blood and saliva, rips itself from the mother root to germinate a hooked beak of its own. It's carnivorous, takes no break between bites, braids itself into diatribes and leaves me mining for truth in the tirade. Though for a moment, I think I witness it shrink, briefly surrendering to a flight response. The creature cowers behind overbite obstruction and sucks surrounding teeth at the dinner table, eroding rodent bones to pulp. Unspoken syllables form an airy of sticks secured with raptor spit. You take a swig from your bottle and cap the sneers that come back up. The slurs that fight back out do not mistake a devil biding time for one that has been domesticated. Taloned brute, caged bird of prey, suddenly mauling molars until wing beats crack its coop, wrench apart the bars and embrace a wedge of meat, a substitute for my neck impaled by three prongs. I watch it all return at once, wanting more, taking more, engorge and growl when your beast's feathers devolve to fins and the limp fish is filleted on my good china, the stench will linger over each coming meal like Grace said to the wrong god. We will double bag the garbage that night and tuck our fatigued tongues into separate beds too early in the evening and far too late for forgiveness. Um, and then my second poem is titled The Oven. Beneath the rusted drainage grate of an oven rack, there are blotchy remnants of brown gravy, hot tar which once pooled where the metal pitches, drowning stray lentils and breadcrumbs that still gravel the appliance's belly. There is sauce splattered into sidewalk chalk shapes, disfigured suns and flowers now crusted with mold. The reek of rotted food overwhelms as if the oven itself is decaying, roadkill, long dead but dragged further up the road by tires until ground into asphalt. I moan and you wretch at, at the scene as two takeout menus unfurl in our guilty hands, pink with road rash. Thank you. Great work, Jillian. Stick secured with raptor spit. It's great, um, great work. 
Next, we have Mike Dinicola. Hi, so I'm going to be reading two poems. Uh, the first one is Dirty Umbrella in the Shade. Um, intervening on a dry spring mood, she was there. Under sheets, under pliable temperatures, she was there. Hefty, the tangible things became when the ice in her glasses kissed. An embryonic tilt to her shade, she was often there, but never here. When he left, she was going in summer, she was gone in the summer air, like steam, like smoke, the art of taking the passion of what is when she was never there. And then the other one I wrote uh, is a fly between glass. Um, this is a, there is a crisscross black mark on the wall from when I moved my dresser in the beginning, unimproved, but that's close to the spark of being somewhere new that isn't an earmarked beach shore or the other typical approved and sanitized locations beyond the removed and barred diner booth landmarks. Yet, when can I take you where I haven't been? Between a branch and its leaf before the wind beheaded its gate, possibly obscene, feeling such like a has-been before I wasn't permitted beyond my back door, but until then, I'll wait. Great work, Mike. I'll be thinking about, uh, I'll be thinking about the art of taking probably this week. So thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, next, we have Roy Ferrara. Hey there, everybody. How's it going? Uh, so I'm a history major, and I'm actually graduating this semester. And this is a poem I wrote in CWL202 last semester, and it's called Storm Clouds. You hear the echoes of the rain falling outside. You see it through your window, shining through the night sky. Your head is filled your with fog. You can barely think straight. What do you feel? What's going on outside your door? Lightning? Thunder? Torrents? The rain falls down harder and harder. How do you feel? You look out the window. The inky abyss of the night sky expands into the horizon. Why do you feel? You hear the thunderclap. You see the lightning flashing in the sky. You don't know what to feel. Oops, sorry, hold on. You open the door as the sound engulfs your senses. You're wet, but you don't care at all. You don't care if someone stares or however they judge for once. Just a moment alone in the rain. Do you deserve to feel? The rain, the feeling of the rain makes you shiver. Sorry. You didn't care about putting on your raincoat or shoes. You just want to experience the sensation. It feels like ice on your skin, pure, cold, yet soothing. How does it feel on your head? You walk through the neighborhood. Your path is illuminated by streetlights. It's a peaceful experience. The shivering of the cold fall rain, the feeling. Thoughts engulf your head as you walk along your path. Are you happy? What do you want in life? Is this what you want? Your attention is drawn by the thunder above, the shock, the boom, it shakes your core. You have a hard time waking up day by day. Your mind races with different emotions day by day. They permeate within your head every single moment, ringing in your head like a bell. Do you care? Maybe, maybe not. The soil turns to mud as you continue your path. It squishes under your feet as you walk in the grass. Are you comfortable? You unlock a foreign feeling, something you haven't felt in months, the sensation, euphoria. It brings a subtle smile to your face. You spend the better up part of an hour there. You don't even know if you want to go back home. You sit down on a nearby bench. You stopped caring about being wet a long time ago. All that matters is you and the rain. A moment away from the world. A moment away from your mind. A moment standing with the storm clouds can sometimes remove the storm clouds. Well done, Roy. I love the use of second person in your work. Fantastic. Next, we have Lydia Green. Um, hello. This is a piece that I wrote for my memoir class. It's called an objective correlative, where you use either the, the repetition of either an object or a phrase or a setting to represent some emotion. So here goes. This is something that should be hotter. My grandpa's hands trembled slightly as he handed the mug back to my grandma, the white mug full of coffee that apparently wasn't hot enough for him. He didn't know what it was. He didn't know who was giving it to him. All he knew was that it needed to be hotter. This is something that should be hotter. My grandpa had once spoken four languages. His Spanish accent had been horrible, but his vocabulary and grammar had always been impeccable. This is something that should be hotter. My grandpa had been incredibly intelligent. He'd never been seen without a book in his hand. He'd read all the classics, Charles Dickens, Herman Melville, Ernest Hemingway. He'd read for pleasure, 
For him, the immense tome that was Moby Dick had been light reading to unwind before bed. This is something that should be hotter. My grandpa had always been a people person. Everyone he met liked him. Everyone he met became his friend. He'd been a jewel salesman selling diamonds with his three brothers. He'd been in charge of interacting with the customers. The customers had all loved him. They'd been willing to drop thousands of dollars on jewels and diamonds simply because the man at the shop was so likable. This is something that should be hotter. Adventure had been my grandpa's middle name. He'd woken up early every morning and made his way down to the beach. He had loved the ocean, loved the smell of the salty ocean breeze and the sound of the seagulls squawking. That's where my dad and I get it from. This is something that should be hotter. I was born very prematurely. They had to keep me in the hospital for a long time after I was born because I was so small. I had to be hooked up to several machines at all times, feeding tubes, oxygen, IVs. Grandpa had come to visit me in the hospital. He'd pick me up and started bouncing me on his knee. The machines had gone berserk. The nurse had started freaking out. My grandpa had looked at her and smiled innocently. What did I do? I'm bouncing her on my knee. That's what you're supposed to do with kids. To this day, my dad and I call her panic nurse. This is something that should be hotter. My grandpa was an intellectual. Grandpa was a jewel salesman. Grandpa was a people person. Grandpa was multilingual. But that grandpa is gone. All that's left is this is something that should be hotter. Lydia, that was great. That's how you do repetition, folks. Very well done. All right, next we have Fiona Lamb. Hi, everyone. My name is Fiona Lamb. I'm a freshman, and this is a poem I, I wrote called Talking to the Sun. On nights that Bruno Mars claims he sits by himself talking to the moon, I prepare to converse with the sun the next morning. And when I look out my kitchen window, my vision partially blocked by bonsai plants lined up on the wooden windowsill. Do you see me trying to get to you? When golden rays of the star closest to earth glint off the neighboring rooftops and hit my face at just the right angle, does a warm fuzzy feeling seep its way into your heavily guarded heart? When that initial sip of my piping hot coffee comes off more bitter than balanced with the hazelnut creamer I use, can you taste it too? And on slow mornings like these, do you lie awake listening or remain asleep wandering? And when I anxiously wait for the sun to respond, I know that we are light years away from each other. But perhaps I still cross your mind and maybe our hearts still beat in sync to the songs we used to listen to. But is it out of place of me to say that I am happy all alone? Your absence is consistent and your heart you've shown is stone. So maybe I've gotten used to no answers on your end, but on mine, you might still be the boy I once called my best friend. It is dangerous to stare directly at the sun, but to see you again, I would ignore the, consequence, the consequences as if there were none. No, I am not still stuck in the past, but do you think maybe our love was meant to last? Or was it even what they call love? I no longer cry at the thought of you, yet it makes me sad the pain has really gone away this time. The pain made it real and allowed me to feel like once upon a time we meant something. On nights that Bruno Mars claims he sits by himself talking to the moon, I prepare to converse with the sun the next morning. And when our words are no longer threads of texts, and I don't recall the sound of your voice, is there really nothing you have to say to me? When I am completely out of your reach and the silence between us fills every inch of the room, do you sit in a comfortable sense of relief? When the somber beats of your favorite music come close to bringing tears to your eyes, do you resist a feel? And when I anxiously wait for the sun to respond, I know that we are light years away from each other. But perhaps you still find yourself smiling at once was at what once was our inside joke, or you wonder whether the shade of green I used for the picture I drew you is the one that I like. But is it out of place of me to say that I will not come back this time? I still care even if you do not, but it is a long climb to self-love and I need to be alone for me to see that the only validation I need is my own. It is dangerous to stare directly at the sun, but to watch you as you play your guitar but to watch you sing as you play your guitar again, I would ignore the consequences as if there were none. And when we inevitably meet eye to eye, am I still the girl you fell for last July or has your image of me simply become a bad thought? And when the sun hides away and the day comes to a close, who is it that you love the most? Thank you. 
Beautiful, Fiona. Thank you. The pain made it real. That's a great line. Thank you. Next, we have Cassidy Mullen. Uh, hi, I'm Cass. I'm a sophomore here at Stony Brook. Uh, this is something I wrote during class time, actually, in my CWL310 class. Uh, we got a prompt to just start writing a poem like it's a diary entry, and I ran with it. So, sorry if I'm a little anxious. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so I was talking to my girl, right? But I'm not allowed to call her that around people we know, and it ain't her. I know when I say things like that, it makes her blush all pretty like, but her folks can't find out, you know? They'd ground her, probably kill me. You know how it is. But I was talking to my girl last night at that party, right? And we were just talking, joking and laughing and talking about how dumb we were to push each other away for all those years. How we know each other better than anyone, how we'll love each other even if we crash and burn. And our friend, Tess, blonde, blue eyes, short and prettier than a summer rain. Yeah, that girl. So our friend Tess looks on at us all bittersweet and I ask if she's okay. And she just smiles and shrugs and Alex, goth fever dream Alex? Yeah, Alex. And Alex says, well, Tess's man is kind of shitty. And my girl asks, huh, what kind of shitty? And then Ali says, controlling piece of shit shitty. And my girl, have I told you I love this girl to death? Because my girl goes, we could kill him for you. <laughs> and I mean, she's right. So I wrap her up in my arms and I smiled all sweet at Tess and I told her I really did know how to hide a body and we can kill that guy for you if you want. And I'm pretty sure she thought we were joking because G does that sometimes. But And she saw me agree and must have realized we weren't because she wasn't scared, but by hell was she shocked. And when I tell you I don't think anyone's ever stood up for her before, will you believe me? Because this girl, this baby looked just like that. That look of awe and surprise we all got the first time someone acts like we're more than dirt. Man, it fucking hurt to see. And you see, I was talking to my girl last night and we agreed, sorry, we figured that if he ever starts shoving her around, he might just disappear from the shame. Yeah, that's it, the shame. And so I was talking to my girl last night about what was wrong and what was right and how the law thinks his mistakes are better than what Tess would never have us do. And ain't that the point of the good fight? A few of us sinners go down so a few of us sinners go down hard so innocent girls like that don't have to. I was talking to my girl last night and her folks wanted her home by dawn, which was funny, right? Could be out all night shooting fucking dope for all they care, but God forbid she sleep at my place. God forbid she's in my bed, right? And they say it's for God, right? That they want his love, but fuck, I've never met people so full of hate. I was talking to my girl last night, right, about how we're just trying to fight the good fight and love good love, be good to one another like our parents never were. But when it comes to our families, we're really just trapped, you know? I told you I love her, right? I told you I die for her, right? So I was talking to my girl last night. Well, Cassidy, that was such a good reading. Great job. Thank you for that. Um, next, we have Devin Overend. Hi everyone, my name is Devin. Um, I'm a sophomore and I'm a creative writing major. Uh, this is a spoken word piece I wrote, kind of just encapsulating all the feelings I've been feeling due to this pandemic and the things I've gone through. Um, it's a little intense, but I'm feeling pretty good about it. She pulled at my cheeks that night. Play-Doh face, Play-Doh face. I can make you whatever I want you to be, that bitch grinned. She's anxiety and grief and no sleep. And she makes me so weak when she squishes my cheeks and yells, smile. Oh, the cliche poems, the ones that read, it's okay not to be okay, but they forget about her hands, making my body cold, making my young soul feel old, squeezing my brain in a way that makes me feel clinically insane. Okay not to be okay? Then tell me why no one calls when I'm crying and no one points out when I'm trying, but it's all love when I'm smiling. So I let her pull my cheeks and tug on my lips and mold my Play-Doh face into a smile. She wipes my tears and whispers, no one cares, no one cares. Fake it until you make it. She whitens my teeth and does my hair. This is what they see. This is what they see. This is it. She knows she hurt me, but she blames it on life. 
She says, it's not my fault you had to watch your grandpa die on a screen. It's not my fault you had to watch your father die as a child. It's not my fault you only see your loved ones in dreams. It's not my fault dreams are when you feel the most loved. But when you wake up, but then you wake up. It's not my fault you're in a constant existential crisis about what's real and fake. Baby, it's not my fault you eat that toxic cake. Oh, and she won't stop squishing my Play-Doh face. I let her make me into something perfect, but only to the human eye. She's the only one that sees me cry. Oh, the sonnets about life's mysteries and life's beauties, the ones about the incredible places and the beautiful faces. They forget about me and her and my Play-Doh face. They forget about how it feels to feel fake. Play-Doh face, Play-Doh face. Make me whoever you want. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. I want to thank everyone for uh, going to intense places and capturing the emotion of their work. It's, it's, it's powerful, it's inspiring, and um, for our listeners, thank you. Uh, next, we have Ryan Perizzo. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be reading a creative nonfiction piece called Nothing Left Unsaid. I remember a butterfly landing on my shoe while I waited for her to catch up, beating its wings lazily in the heat of a, of a dying summer. I'm sorry, she said. It's okay, Mom. There's no hurry. I stuffed my hands into my pockets, and fiddled with the keys hidden inside. At least my legs feel strong today, she said. I don't feel like I'm going to fall over. Her faint chuckle trickled onto the uneven sidewalk. Yeah. I said, how are you feeling? You know, I hate that question, she hissed before I had even finished asking. Sorry, yeah. She had told me once how much she hated it after a family reunion where people had lined up to ask that same question. She said it was a reminder, a reminder when all she wanted to do was forget. That was three years ago, already two more than they'd first thought. What happened with your car? It died, turning into the parking lot, thankfully, but the transmission died. How will you get home? I shrugged. I don't know. The sidewalk snaked around the back of the building, where its outer edge was embraced by a host of immaculately maintained flowers. White stargazer lilies, pink and purple chrysanthemums, and an undertow of forget-me-nots. She shuffled with her walker, smearing a trail of tennis ball fuzz in her wake. I walked in the grass between the building and the sidewalk. The drawn out blades curled over the toes of my shoes, begging to be trimmed. The end of our path approached, culminating in a small shaded grove, a series of spindly trees stretching toward the cloudless sky. A stone bench with room for two waited for us, strate <clears throat> strategically placed in the center. She sat down, dabbing at beads of sweat with her favorite purple bandana, I kicked at the dried brown mulch that had crept onto the sidewalk. Crazy weather, right? She asked. I suppose, I said without looking up. We had snow this time last year, didn't we? Yeah, we did. That was crazy too. Yeah. She waited. Her way of asking me to say more, but I couldn't think of anything. Do you want to talk about it? She sighed, resigning herself to the inevitable conversation the part that she had fought with life and limb to avoid. I looked at her for the first time since I had arrived. She reclined on the stone bench, one hand on the walker, just in case the vertigo came back. Even with the generic compression socks and nondescript gown, she radiated her usual air of regal dignity. Her slippers are filthy, I thought, promising myself that I'd bring her new ones next time I came. I opened my mouth to speak wondering which of a million questions would come first. No, I said. She looked confused, and I can only imagine that I did as well. Next time, I continued, we can talk about it. Let's just enjoy right now. Okay, she said. I wrapped my arms around her, fixating on the placard bolted to the back of the bench. In memoriam was all I could read, the rest disappearing behind the folds of 
our embrace. On our pilgrimage back inside, I told her that I would be back in a couple of days and we'd do this again, hopefully without the walker. She smiled at the thought and we never spoke again. All right, that was beautiful and powerful. Thank you very much. Next, we have Emma Rowan. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a sophomore. I'm just reading a brief uh, poem that I wrote this past semester called To Texas, circa February 2021. Um, keep your hands and feet warm, especially your head. Use hats, socks, gloves, etc. The world is on fire and you're freezing to death. Of all the droughts, the heat waves, the melting ice caps, the dying polar bears, I don't think anyone's imagined apocalypse, including the ice age and the Lone Star State. Turn on all your faucets, just slightly, so as to keep your pipes from bursting. The blues are laughing at the ruin of a red state. Our compassion, our respect for human life is limited to political fault lines, as if a state stance lies solely on the shoulders of any single individual, as if streets stained with solid crimson aren't resting on a frozen blue ground as if California's wildfires didn't turn their skies red. None of it matters when it's all up in flames. Put towels, blankets, et cetera, over windows and under doors for insulation. You weren't prepared for a thing like this. I mean, a thing like this has never happened, but the homeless people living in alleyways and sleeping on park benches, they were homeless. And the poor people who couldn't pay their bills, they were still gonna lose power. And the hungry people who couldn't afford food, they were hungry. And the years of carbon emissions and deforestation and fossil fuels and pollution and oil spills and forest fires and extinctions and greenhouse gases and coal mines and finite resources. And if you have gas available, a pot of water on the stove can help to increase heat and humidity. Texas, we failed you. Any place where billionaires investing in oil pipelines exist, while millions of people don't have a place to sleep at night. Any place where the threat of destruction has been known for decades and remained ignored and doubted and left to burn out in the cold has already failed. Hot air rises. The warmest place in your house will be on the upper floor. Congregate there. Texas, what can I say to you? There's people accidentally killing themselves sitting in their garages, surrounded by boxed Christmas decorations and bikes with training wheels in the front seat of their minivans. There's corpses frozen to the sidewalk outside of 7-Elevens. There's nothing beautiful or poetic or metaphoric about any of it. Do not ever bring a generator inside. It should be at least 30 feet from your house at all times. Texas, you don't need a poem. You need electricity and shelter and food and water and warmth. You need support and prayers and miracles. You need the reversal of the doomsday device, decades in the making, made by people for other people and gifted from generation to generation. Avoid frostbite and hypothermia by avoiding exposure. Stay warm and stay inside. If you do not have a house of your own, find somewhere to take shelter. If you do not have power or hot water, consider the following tips. Great job, Emma. Thank you. I love the dichotomy of that. That was, that was great. Um, next, we have Eclipse Scott. Hi, um, I'm Eclipse uh, Shiva. I'm a journalism major, senior. Um, I'm the president of LGBTA. Um, and this is a villanelle that I wrote for Professor Beeson's uh, CW, CWL uh, 310 class called To Make Myself Right. Return my dresses to that shut down store cut me down and let me die. Do only I recall this petty war. I'm miserable as I was before, but I guess that's where they're bound to lie. You returned my dresses to that shut down store. I've considered dying on the kitchen floor. I know I'll miss the Montauk sky. Do only I recall this petty war. I have pronouns that people ignore. And dad mocked my friend's piercings, why? Just to return my dresses to that shutdown store? I said a hundred dollars, but I spent so much more when Taylor and I hit the dusky mall in senior high. Oh, so only I recall this petty war. One day I'll get sick of this shit and slam the door and I'll drive to the mall with a list to buy. I'll buy back my dresses from that shutdown store because I, because only I recall this little war. Fantastic Eclipse, another great example, great usage of repetition, fantastic. Um, next we have Lauren Talienti. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Talienti. Um, 
I will be reading an excerpt from a collection of essays that I've been working on. And, and it's the same collection that I read from last semester in the student showcase. I think it was on December 9th. So the collection is called uh, Colonization of Cats. And this excerpt is specifically called Grandma Taliente's House. Interior, Grandma Taliente's House, day 2004. I am four years old and filled with the inherent admiration and joy that instinctually accompanies seeing a precious creature. The creature is my grandmother's black and white cat, Domino. A gentle smile spreads across my face and I speak to Domino softly as to calm her. Reaching my hand out hesitantly, I am met with a hiss and sharp claws which paint my skin with my own blood. She scratches, rips, and tears. I watch. I do not fight off Domino. I can never hurt her. I could never hurt her because she is a living being and I love her. Why would I hurt those I love? After just a few minutes, Domino makes my arms look like a Jackson Pollock painting, except she stabs her canvas and the paint flows out of its seams, whereas dear Mr. Pollock layered and splattered his paint onto his canvas. My grandmother retrieves the hydrogen peroxide and yells at Domino. The scratches burn with a type of pain I had never felt before, but I do not cry. I tell my grandmother that it's, it's fine and that I don't mind. I just sit there and watch the blood trickle out of my veins, wait for her to bend my wounds and watch Domino. Sitting beside me as if she had not just lacerated my arms, as if she had not just done that to me. Had she done it to me or not, it didn't matter. All that mattered at that point was how I was cleaned up. I couldn't control Domino, nor did I want to. She was just doing what she thought was right. She didn't know any better. Thank you. That was great, Lauren, thank you. Next, we have Natalie Taveras. Um, hi, my name's Natalie. I'm a psych major and a creative writing minor. Um, and I'm gonna read an excerpt from a story that I wrote for Creative Writing 305 for Professor Crane. Um, Luckily for Raphael, adrenaline can make the human body do unexplainable things, but so can being a professional athlete. According to his research, he had made good time on the whole process. When his shovel hit the wood of the casket lid, he repositioned it and used it as a crowbar to pry it open. It was a lot harder to see Sienna like that than he expected. She was beautiful, even in decomposition, but it was just a sick reminder that she was truly dead. The tears welled up in Raphael's eyes, <clears throat> the familiar knot formed in his throat. He couldn't help but let out a few shuddering sobs as he reached into the casket to pick her up and cradle her into his arms. It was never supposed to be like this. Raphael pressed a few kisses onto her discolored skin, stroking her head, hushing her like a child who was wounded. It's going to be okay, he whispered as he collected her and wrapped her gently in the heavy blankets he had bought. He let out a small sob as he closed the empty casket. He rushed against the clock and filled the grave back in, trying to keep from being too loud. The dirt went in faster than it came out, and Raphael did his best to, top, to flatten the top layer. Hopefully no one would look too hard. Exhausted from the dig, he used his remaining strength to carry Sienna and the shovel back into the car, her body feeling lighter than it should have been. The journey home wasn't too bad. He turned on her favorite radio station, and this time he was almost entirely able to ignore the strange reflections in the rear view mirror. Sitting in the center of the chalk circle, he cradled Sienna in his arms. He was told he had to be focused for this, but even after everything, he felt at ease. The weight of Sienna on his arms was comforting and he couldn't believe he didn't think to do this sooner. He pressed his lips against the brunette again. Almost everything was in place. He just needed to light his candles, say his wish and draw his blood. As the light illuminated the room, Raphael remembered that he was supposed to speak. Raphael took a deep breath. The smell of earth and rot filled his lungs. He shivered a little and closed his eyes as he held Sienna closer. I'm here because I'm seeking to be reunited with Sienna Downs. We were supposed to get married. Silence. The candle swayed. Raphael took another breath and tried again. I'm seeking to be reunited with Sienna Downs. We will get married and we'll be together wherever we go. I offer my blood for this. He paused. The candle stood straight. The breeze gone. 
He kissed her once more and reached for his knife. I offer my blood and life to give her life. I offer my blood and life to keep her here with me forever. He glanced over his instructions again. He shivered as the blade pressed against his skin and raised the bleeding cut to Sienna's lips, the drop dripping into her mouth. He stared down at her, expecting her eyes to open at any moment, but nothing. Raphael bit his lip and felt the tears well in his eyes. Thank you. Excellent, Natalie. It was beautiful. Next, we have Noreen Townsend. Good afternoon, I'm Noreen Townsend. I'm a senior graduating this semester. Um, I'm a psych major with a minor in creative writing. And this piece is part, uh, it's an excerpt from a memoir. Uh, the memoir is about uh, when I had my first child at 17. I lived on the edge of the twin bed on the weekends. My windows at the Regina residence looked out over a four-way intersection with St. Charles Hospital directly on the other side. There was a relentless parade of flashing lights and sirens announcing other people's pain. I always remember it as raining, even though it's impossible to have rained every single weekend for five months. Water on the window blurred my view of the stoplight, red, yellow, green. Tail lights and headlights danced in a particular way under a particular particular set of rules, rules of the road. Those droplets on the glass mesmerized me as if each one held a different and separate sorrow inside and they'd thrown themselves out and away from the clouds thinking to end it. They joined forces as they ran down the pane like misery loves company, green, yellow, red. I had no idea what color my tears were. They were just wet. They were just there like me every weekend. I could have visitors on the weekends. It was the reason I spent so much time on the edge of the twin bed staring out the window. I was looking for a familiar car. Few ever came. If someone was going to come, I knew about it, and this gave purpose to my vigil. There had been numerous times Bobby had promised to come and didn't. All that watching gone to waste. He visited only twice in the nearly five months I was there. My mother drove him once. His brother, Frank, drove a second time. Bobby was 28 years old and didn't have a car. We went to Chandler Square Park on a warm fall day with his brother. He and his brother played guitar on a bench and the poor Jefferson hippies gathered in a crowd. They all wanted to put their hands on my belly to feel the baby kick. Those strangers were not whose hands I wanted on my belly. Thank you. That was great, Noreen. I had no idea what color my tears were. That stays with me. It was a great story. Thank you. Um, next, we have Kim Vu. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kim. I am a junior geology major, minoring in creative writing. And this is a piece called When the One You Love Calls You Whore. His message is glow terribly on your phone. You know, when you posted that, I thought you went full on whore. You're texting the one you love whose heart no longer belongs to you. You had broken up a year ago and only recently come back to a newfound friendship. Even if you could never be together, you're happy to keep him close. So when he calls you whore, your first reaction is to send the smiling emoji with a single drop of sweat lining its face. The one who looks ashamed because suddenly you are. Yeah, it was kind of bad. You have to bite back the apology, the habitual thing that falls too easily off your tongue because you know there's nothing to apologize for. You try not to lose yourself. And on that wonderful, wonderful note of you calling me a whore, I'm going to bed, good night. He reads the tension creeping behind your words and tries to explain. I mean, I can't help my thoughts. My mind is, well, my mind, so you can imagine what went on in there. But yeah, good night. Bitterness brews in your stomach. You try to keep your hands steady. I feel like it shouldn't be a word in your vocabulary when describing any girl and the less of what you're thinking. But yeah, good night. For once, you think you have the last word until, okay, feminist. You know what he's doing. He doesn't have to face the accountability for his words if he blames you for being offended. 
He doesn't have to apologize if he's not in the wrong. You're used to it. The defense he puts up to make himself bigger than he will ever be. You won't take his bait this time. You leave the conversation, angry at the one you love and angry that you were stupid enough to fall for someone like that in the first place. You delete the picture, afraid of being the whore he thinks you are. After all, you know what you did the last year. All the boys you kissed and all the alcohol you drank to drown away the reality that your lips could not touch the lips of the one you love. You don't talk to him and you try your hardest not to think about him. You can't. Not without frustration rising up your chest and shame filling in your stomach. And maybe he can't talk to you, not without fearing your anger and his own unspoken apology. A stalemate. Your friendship, as quickly as it had come back, is gone again. You live your life and deny yourself the hurt until it rains down on you a month and a half later, unexpected. And you hate yourself for being hurt by something as intangible as a word. Whore. No, not that one. Feminist. You hate that he called you that. You hate that he took something good and spoke it with such venom. You hate that he twisted a piece of your girlhood and made it a weapon, an insult. You hate that he dismissed you and dismissed the entirety of woman. And most of all, you hate that you have to fight the desire to text him because it's been a month and a half since he's called you whore and you miss him. In the end, you don't. You choose yourself and you settle into the fact that he will never know how much he hurt you or how wrong it is that he calls you whore while you call him the one you love. Or that even now, nearly a year later, you cannot think of him without aching. And you, and you settle in the fact that he will never care. After all, it's not his fault that you're a feminist who doesn't like being called whore. Thank you. Great job, Kim. Thank you. I love that you pulled so much meaning by focusing on singular words. That's really beautiful. Um, next, we have Megan Young. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Megan. I'm a sophomore. Um, I'm a pre-med student with a, doing a major in creative writing. Um, I'm going to be reading an ex excerpt from a fiction piece titled Free Trial. An android may not express individual desire. That was live text third and final bylaw. If any or all of these regulations are violated, the android is considered defective and must be returned to your nearest providing live tech institution immediately. Sergeant, the foundation of the abandoned warehouse trembled against a peal of thunder. Quinn peeled herself from the clammy fractured tile, her coat damp and heavy with rain. Sergeant Borgett, it's in here. She scrambled to her feet, following Mitchell's voice around the static of the ongoing storm, jaw throbbing from where the defect had punched her. She found Mitchell near the back exit with her gun in his hands. Its barrel pointed directly at the hourglass figure backed up against the rusting metal of what had once been a storage shelf. A haunting, intoxicating feminine face stared back at them in the dark. A collar reading, property of Mark Hogan, and underneath, Roxy, flashed an urgent red, like a broken siren drowned out by the thunder. The android's face crumpled, as if it were about to cry, as Quinn rounded the corner. Please, it said. What should I do, Sergeant? Mitchell said sharply, gaze and gun honed fastidiously on the defective EA-2. What should you do? Shoot it! No, 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 wait, don't, the defective shouted, lifting its hands. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Its eyes were like that of a doe, round and downturned. It turned them to Mitchell. Please, you know what they're like. I was just defending myself. Quinn stepped forward and it, and it abruptly averted its gaze. You'll never see me again. I won't do it again, I promise. Please, I don't, I don't want. Its eyelids fluttered erratically and the rapid flashing of its collar bathed surrounding surfaces in a deep fluctuating vermilion. I don't want to die. The lull in the scene that followed was taut but brief, lasting no longer than a second. A moment during which Quinn vividly recalled how Dustin McDonough's cerebrum had stained the floorboards of his own living room. Some undefined fervency rose and curdled at the base of her gut, wrapping bony fingers around her own entrails and squeezing nausea into the back of her throat, a visceral recreation of how she had been able to trace the path of the bullet from the IA-4's rifle through the ragged and bloody cavity in Kirkland Marsh's skull, how his body had sharply lurched forward upon impact, and how the Mitchell had not so much as glanced at him on its way to the limp body of the convict. Quinn recalled how much Kirk had liked that android. 
he had, a, he had liked that Android a lot. You're going to disown me for this, I swear, but I'm actually glad Mitchell's on the team, he told Quinn the day before I killed him. It had been raining that night, too. Quinn turned to the IAX. Mitchell's grip on the gun was as unwavering as his expression, entirely focused as it was impartial. The only indication that he was paying attention at all was the gentle pulsing of his collar that illuminated the underside of his face with a pale green light. Property of Life Tech Inc., it said. Please, the defective whimpered. I don't want... Mitchell shoot, Quinn said, and without hesitation, Mitchell pulled the trigger. That was great, Megan. That was some great storytelling. Fantastic. Our last reader this afternoon is Medea Zia. Hello, my name is Medea Zia. I'm a junior majoring in biology and minoring in creative writing. Um, I'm going to be reading two poems from my final portfolio. Um, the first poem is a villanelle. It's titled, A Brown Girl's Mantra. Why are you wearing red lipstick to go out at night? What will people say? Did you see Vivia Fatima in May? They never use fair and lovely. No wonder they're not late. Why are you acting on Bollywood? You should be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, doing what's right. What will people say? Did you see Simran celebrating her 30th birthday? What a shame. There's still no husband in sight. Lo kya kenge. Why isn't there a baby on the way? Depriving your husband of a child he can teach to fly a kite? What will people say? Did you know that people will always talk, but it's okay? Take a breath, lift your head, and always be ready to fight. Lo kya kenge. Try not to care about what people will say. And my second poem is an Ekphrastic. It was based on a photograph by Hannah Reyes Morales. Um, she does photography and her focus is on um, following girls from girlhood into motherhood. So this poem is titled Mother. Six feet under, but still alive. More than simply alive, she's given life for the first time when she was 16. She should have been in school complaining about classwork, then going shopping with her friends. Instead, she was home, surrounded by family, but still alone. She gave life for a second time when she was 18. She should have been committing to college, wondering about what her future holds. Instead, she was kicked out from her home with her two children, no place to go. When the living turned their heads, she turned to the dead, making a place among the tombstones, making a home. Thank you. Thank you, Medea. Uh, I love that you were able to use cross mediums, the photography to influence your work. That was great. Folks, that was an emotional, inspiring experience. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your art. The range of craft elements and the range of meaning in art was powerful. Thank you. Keep up the good work as you continue to create for folks of you out there listening, keep up the good work in your imagination and in your work. I wanna thank Amy Shiner and Molly Godry for putting this together. I wanna to thank Frank Imperial for being the technical support on the back end and making this art and inspiration become an internet. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Amy. And again, Thank you to our readers. That was just fantastic and powerful. Folks, as you, the semester comes to end, hang in there and have a safe and healthy and meaningful summer. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for the work you did.